I wish I had Jesus' problem when everybody was sitting in the front fighting for the best place. You know, in our church, like most churches, people by nature tend to be in the back. And I have to say that I am very proud of you that after eight years you have migrated closer and closer to the front. I remember how much effort that pulling process has taken me over the years to pull you closer to the altar, but thank you for seeing the advantages of being closer to the liturgical action. Today I wanted to talk to you about wives' tales. You know, every culture, every family has all kinds of wives' tales. My grandma used to tell me, don't play with fire, you will pee all over yourself at night. <laughs> that was my grandmother's wives' tale. What kind of wives' tales have you been told? What kind of wives' tales do you know? Louder, please. Mary? Bad girls smoke. Well, we will not step into that judgment statement. Any other wives' tales? Don't sing at the table, you will meet a crazy woman. That, that could be true, I guess. Virginia? Oh my goodness. If you drink coffee, your knees will turn black. Oh, she was from Finland. I guess they don't grow coffee over there. You know the one about walking under a ladder? That you're not supposed to walk under a ladder? Don't do what? Oh, don't make an ugly face because it's going to freeze on you. That's true. You know, most of the wives' tales sound funny to us today, but they usually have some historical and factual background and reasons for their existence. I don't know what's the reasons with the coffee and black knees. <laughs> Maybe if you get too caffeinated, you will fall down and scratch your knees, who knows? But usually if you go back enough, there will be some kind of a reason. Now we say there is no smoke without a fire. There is no wives' tale without a reason. The reason for my grandmother saying that because my mom used to water herself when she was younger, and my grandma blamed it on playing with fire. So nobody else would play with the fire because she was tired of washing bed sheets so often. But that's how tales function. Long, long time ago, something happened, and so a proverb, a wives tale, was invented to prevent it from happening. The same process Bible scholars say can be applied to creating Bible stories and the text of the gospel. There was an issue, there was a problem, and so a story was written, a text was composed to address that particular issue. Today's gospel leads us to believe that in the early church, there was an issue with people gathering for the banquet, i.e. the Eucharist, and focusing on the wrong things, becoming very exclusive, becoming very up high noses. Who are we not? You don't belong here. This is a serious church. 
there is a church for those people like you over there, two blocks to the west. For some reason, in the early Christian communities, some of these communities became exclusive and the name they were using was Gnostic. They believed that they had special privileged knowledge, that they were chosen, the few by God, to receive secret understanding. And so not everyone would be welcomed to their Eucharistic celebrations. Those celebrations would be by invitation only. You would have to know a secret handshake or perhaps had to be invited by someone who knows you to be a part of such a Eucharistic banquet. And so Luke is addressing that issue when he's composing the text we heard today. Every time in the Gospels there is something about a feast, about a banquet reception, we may presume that theologically speaking, it is about the Eucharist. Gospel does not mention reception or a feast without making an allusion to the most important feast that Christians celebrate together. Who is invited to the Eucharist? Why would the first Christians make it such a secret and privileged experience? At the very heart of the Eucharist, we Christians, especially Catholics, believe is the body and blood of Christ. We've been told since our childhood that Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. In many churches on the altar table, they have these words carved in front of the table, do this in remembrance of me. And so we often presume that Jesus meant break the bread and drink the wine, experience something mystical, something spiritual, experience the mystical communion with myself. And that is true, but that is not the entire image. If you focus your understanding of the Eucharist on the body and blood of Christ, you only get half of the picture. If you focus on your mystical experience, on your spiritual communion, you are missing a big part of what Eucharist is about as well. You see, there was much more happening at the Last Supper than just drinking wine and eating bread. Actually, in the Gospel of John, when John describes the Last Supper, he does not mention wine and bread at all. There is no drinking wine. There is no eating bread at the Gospel of St. John in the Last Supper chapter. Jesus gives a long, long sermon. That's why I get it from. And then he washes the feet of his apostles. Washing of the feet is something that is fundamental to our understanding of what Eucharist is all about. Eating the bread, drinking the wine, yes, very important, very spiritual and very necessary part of our life as Christians. But if we leave behind washing of the feet element, we are only doing half of what Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And Luke says, when you prepare a banquet, 
don't invite people like you. Don't invite members of your family, rich neighbors, someone who may repay you for your kindness. Invite people unlike yourself. Invite people who are poor, who are hungry and blind and crippled. Obviously, once again, he's addressing an issue that was taking place in some of the Christian communities. They have become, some of them at least, a circle of mutual adoration. People who think the same, who look the same, who vote the same, who make more or less the same amount of money. And Luke says, you are not supposed to do that. When you throw a feast, when you prepare for the Eucharist, make sure that there will be people less privileged than you, that there will be people included whom you otherwise would not have met. Invite the people you disagree with. Invite the people you don't like. Invite the people from a different social class and then wash their feet. Become their servant. Don't argue with them. Don't try to change their convictions. Don't try to have them switch to your side, but minister to them. Serve them. Wash their feet. Do this in remembrance of me. The full meaning of the Eucharist is fulfilled only when these two elements take part and happen at the same time. When our spiritual and mystical communion encourages us to service those who are marginalized, those who are different than we are. In the last few years, I have been celebrating several African-American weddings. And many of these couples grew up in our neighborhood. Many of their parents lived in the Pruitt Agro projects right all around us. And sometimes they tell me, Father, we are so happy we can have a wedding in this church. Because in the 1950s, my mom told us that we would not be welcome at that Polish church. And now we can come and have our wedding here. This is what Luke is warning us about that our Eucharistic celebrations cannot become a circle of mutual adoration of people who live alike, who think alike, who look alike. When you prepare a banquet, Luke makes Jesus say, invite the poor and the lepers and the hungry, invite those whom you would not be hanging out otherwise. Find people who are not like you and make them want to be a part of this community. This is St. Luke's wife's tale. He invents a story about Jesus going to a dinner and then giving a lesson. Don't fight for the first pew. In our church, Jesus would say, don't fight for the last five rows. And then, when you prepare a banquet, make sure that you will invite people who differ from you and wash their feet. Do this in remembrance of me. The full image, the full understanding of the Eucharist has to contain those two elements, mystical and spiritual, and service 
washing of the feet of our sisters and brothers.